Hello again, everybody. Welcome to case study number 44. This will be a child coming in with dark urine. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. I appreciate it very much. Okay, we got a 10-year-old Hispanic girl coming into the clinic with her stepmom complaining of dark urine for the last two days. The stepmom says that she's been difficult to wake up for school in the morning and has been napping more than usual. She's also not eating as much at dinner, and this is unusual because normally she has a good appetite. Patient says that she just feels tired all the time. She's otherwise been in good health and doesn't have any significant medical issues. Last week, she had a fever and a sore throat, but was not seen as her stepmom says that her brother had a viral infection and everyone in the family was sick. She's not on any medications. And take a look at her vitals. Blood pressure, 138 over 89. Heart rate, 83. Respirations, 23. Temperature, 97.7. And she's satting fine. So she's hypertensive. So what do we know here? Well, we know that she's got possibly some sort of hematuria and fatigue, which points to anemia. And she's got uh, anorexia and she's got hypertension. All right, what are we going to do for our physical? We'll be pretty comprehensive again. She's tired, appealing appearing and she's got pallor. Okay, now that's pointing to anemia. Normal turgor, H-E-N-T is fine except she's got conjunctival pallor. Everything else is fine except, oh boy, pitting edema at the ankles. All right, so now she's got edema. So she's got edema, she's got anemia, she's wiped out. What are we thinking? We got to be thinking renal here. So she's losing protein. And when you're losing protein, you got to think of nephritic and nephrotic syndromes. Now, she's also losing blood. So what we need to do is we need to figure out, is this nephrotic range proteinuria or not? We need to think of nephritides and nephrotides. So causes of nephritis and causes of nephrosis. But this is probably nephritis um, just because... Um, she's losing a lot of red blood cells in addition to protein. So we're going to get a CBC, BMP, urinalysis, a 24-hour urine protein, and then she's got this history of a possible strep infection. So we want to get strep titers. Uh, we're also going to get a throat culture, and we're going to get a serum C3 and C4 because we are along the lines here of a nephritis. And then a renal ultrasound, you may or may not include that. Okay, what do we find? So her CBC showed a hemoglobin of 9.3 and a hematocrit of 28.2 with an MCV of 88. So that all points to a normocytic anemia. Not a surprise given her symptoms and urine color. She's got a low albumin. She's got T-colored urine with proteinuria, hematuria, red blood cell casts, and dysmorphic red blood cells. When you see red blood cell casts and dysmorphic red blood cells, you know that something's going on at the glomerulus. That's the only way you're going to get red blood cell casts. 24-hour urine protein showed a subnephrotic range proteinuria, so now we know that we're dealing with a nephritis. ASO titer was elevated, mean, meaning a recent strep infection or a current strep infection. And the C3 is low. So we have a diagnosis here. And our diagnosis is acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. This follows a strep infection. You get a strep infection, and a couple weeks later, you start to pee out blood. But it doesn't look like blood. It looks like cola or tea. So it's dark urine. They start to get edematous because they lose protein. Their blood pressure goes up because they're retaining water. This is a classic clinical picture of nephritis. And we know it's post-streptococcal because of the ASO and the C3. We'll come back to this. The best initial test is urinalysis. You've got to get it in order to establish the fact that you're dealing with nephritis. But the most accurate test is a renal biopsy. This is rarely done.
The management. Well, we need to tend to two things. We need to tend to the fact that this patient is hypertensive and that this patient is hypervolemic slash edematous. So in order to tend to this, we go with a low sodium diet, fluid restriction, and because she's hypertensive, we need to tend to the blood pressure. So we give them lodipine. Typically, we go with the calcium channel blockers. Um, there's some evidence saying ACE inhibitors are not really safe, but there's really no great evidence to pick one antihypertensive over the other. The evidence I have seen and that I cite here says calcium channel blockers are probably the best. Loop diuretics are always the diuretics we give here when we want to uh, get fluid out of the patient. So we'll use furosemide and amlodipine. Reassure the patient and refer to nephrology. Post-streptococcal post glomerulonephritis is a mouthful, and it also happens to be the most common cause of glomerulonephritis in children. So if you have a child coming in with tea-colored urine, and they're swollen, and they're hypertensive, you really need to think of this. Usually it appears one to two weeks after a throat infection, or three to five weeks after a skin infection, namely here, impetigo. So it can occur after either. The classic features of glomerulonephritis you should be familiar with, they are hypertension and edema. You can also see that in the nephroses as well. Uh, hematuria and red blood cell casts. We saw all of those in this patient. The typical causes of glomerulonephritis in children are post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis and IgA nephropathy. Manifestations are usually mild. They Almost always include hypertension and edema, but in severe cases, you can start to get cerebral edema, you can get headache and focal signs. So that can be a big problem. You've got to monitor that. And that's why we give the antihypertensives and more importantly, the diuretics. To diagnose this, you have the C3 and the ASO. A low C3 almost always in a child means uh, post-strep glomerulonephritis. If it was a normal C3, we would think IgA nephropathy. All right, so the treatment here, we really focus on alleviating the hypertension and the volume overload. So this is really just symptomatic management. Uh, the glomerulonephritis itself is going to go away on its own. Common differentials, membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. Very similar presentation, very similar lab appearance. It tends to be idiopathic, uh, but um, what you will find is that the ASO will be negative because this is not due to strep. Um, if you really don't know, though, you would have to differentiate on renal biopsy. IgA nephropathy presents almost the exact same way. It also tends to follow an infection, but the C3 will be normal. Okay, with post-strep, what's going on is that you're activating the alternative complement pathway. And the alternative complement pathway uses C3, but it does not use C4. And so that's why our C4 levels are normal, but our C3 levels are low. This is a kind of a tree that you can use. This is more for adults. So notice that when you have a low C3 and a normal C4, we're really looking at... Um, post-strep, and then these other causes are potential, uh, but none of these are particularly common in children. There's something, though, that you would want to consider in adults. Post-strep glomerulonephritis tends to be in kids, uh, first decade of life. Um, so if you're dealing with an adult, you may want to think of these things, but we're not going to be working a kid up for lupus when they have a classic presentation of post-strep glomerulonephritis. So to recap, post-strep glomerulonephritis is the most common cause of glomerulonephritis in children, typically appearing one to two weeks after a throat infection or three to five weeks after a skin infection. You should consider this with dark urine in a child. They're typically hypertensive and edematous. The C3 will give it away. It's going to be low. Um, and so that's typically diagnostic. Uh, but a renal biopsy is really technically the only way to know for sure. A nephritic picture plus a normal C3 level is probably IgA nephropathy. 
Management focuses on relieving the hypertension and the volume overload. So for the hypertension, we typically give calcium channel blockers. And for the volume overload, we go with loop diuretics. This goes away on its own. You will want to refer them to pediatric nephrology. But like I said, it tends to go away on its own. It's self-limited. Um, you just need to make sure that you're managing the symptoms properly.